Welcome to Six Feet in the Six. I'm your host, Jeff Barrett with Business Interiors. Thank you for joining us today. The purpose of this interview series is for the close-knit Toronto commercial real estate industry to share ideas and best practices in order to help everyone get back to the office safely and efficiently. We'll be interviewing leaders from commercial real estate, project management, interior design, commercial end users, and product manufacturers. Joining us today is Tatiana Soldatova, co-founder, managing director, strategy and design of Syllable Inc. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Jeff. It's been uh, going to be a pretty fun time. <laughs> having Great. Chat with you. Can you tell the viewers a little bit about yourself? Sure. So um, I founded the company Syllable uh, six years ago with Danny Tsang. So I'm an interior designer. My business partner's an architect. So we're kind of a multidisciplinary duo uh, working together. So we have about a team of uh, 11 people right now. And um, we focus mostly on office interiors, retail, and also doing renovations within buildings. So like condo lobbies, corridors, amenity spaces. So we have three different um, branches right now of design, which has been super helpful during the COVID-19 crisis. So because the retail market has well, it kind of shut down for us to do any renovations. Um, but yeah, I come from, uh, you know, doing design in schools. So I did that for a while. I used to work at CSMP Architects. Then I actually left and joined an innovation firm, Idea Couture. So I, um, you know, once I graduated from Humber um, in 2010, I did the design thing, worked at an architecture firm, and I got really frustrated by um, some lack of leadership or just questioning the business side of things. And I decided to do my master's in strategic design and management from Parsons. So I did that. And while I was doing it, I ended up joining an innovation firm, Idea Couture, which is based in Toronto. Um, and it was a global firm. So I got exposed to a lot of like innovative uh, thinking, design thinking. And from that, I started uh, Syllable with Danny. So, and our whole thing is, you know, we started the firm not just to have a firm for fun. Um, it was more so having, having it be driven by the people. So I wanted to create a working environment that was super positive, you know, no hierarchy, um, having a space where people can feel safe and also feel, you know, that they're growing and they're being constantly pushed um, to continually innovate. So, yeah. That's awesome. No, and uh, I really appreciate spending time with your team. I, I find you guys have a lot of energy. Uh, you're really fun to be with, obviously. And uh, the creativity I see is, is really unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely fun, um, I guess, being more of like a younger design firm, uh, just because we don't have, you know, the corporate ladder. We don't have so much drama. It's kind of like, okay, let's do this or do that. Um, and the best idea wins. That's, you know, idea meritocracy is what we go by. So it doesn't matter if you're a junior, you know, three months out of school to you've been doing this for 10 years. If one idea is better than the other, that's how it goes. Personally, how are you managing? Uh, are you asking that personally as in mentally me or the business? <laughs> uh, personally, physically, mentally, how are you managing? Um, honestly, I feel when, you know, beginning of Mar like mid-March, I was like, awesome. I have less emails nobody's calling me. I thought this was great. I got a bit of a break. I uh, didn't have to rush around because I was always kind of go, 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 go. And I thought, wow, this is great having a bit of a pause. And, but I'm a very social person. I go out to events constantly downtown. I'm always, you know, usually go to work. I go home, change, and then I go out again. So that pattern at the beginning was nice having a break for two, three weeks. And then after week three, four, I yeah, I went through a, like a, a deep roller coaster dive of just not being in a good place. And I think a lot of people kind of have gone through that, of, you know, being almost like no motivation, you know, feeling depressed, not wanting to do anything. And yeah, it was hard. On weekends, I started doing brunches. So I do brunches every weekend with my friends, um, different pockets of friends here and there. And I started doing virtual brunches. So I'd send out, um, you know, an invite uh, to like a friend and say, hey, here's what we're making. So we'd do a new recipe and we'd cook it together, but separate <laughs> in our own kitchens. I also started working out a lot. I like... I feel so fit right now <laughs> um, doing so many workouts. I think I do like three times a week right now. And those really do keep me sane. Cause I find if I don't work out or, you know, sweat it out, uh, I, I go through a funk. So how has your work from home experience been? 
when we started the company, I made sure everything was available. So our Revit models are available online. We use Google Drive, we use Gmail, and um, we had quite a bit of laptops in the office as well. So working remote was easy and any licenses, which I hate the subscription models of all like Autodesk and you know Adobe. I hate them because they charge you every month rather than just getting one software for the year. Um, I hate them, but they worked out really well because you can just log out on one computer and log in somewhere else and it was totally fine. So yeah, it was fine. Um, we use Asana for, um, which is pretty expensive. We use it for like project management, task tracking, accountability. So you can see what everyone's doing. You're in the office now. Uh, when was, can you remember your last in-person meeting? Uh, I don't remember my last in-person meeting. I remember my last in-person outing, which I went to see come from away. Okay. Uh, that was really cool. That was the last thing I, I did. And yeah, I don't remember my last meeting. I feel like it was just like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I'm lucky enough, you know, our office is in Liberty Village and I live in Liberty Village as well. So for me, I feel as though I'm lucky because I can walk from my house to the office and it's empty. So I do have another space. Who did you see last? Two people from IBI, which I talked about in the last episode. So I'm going to go back one more. And it was a coffee break at a design firm. And uh, it was really interesting because... I probably shouldn't have been there, to be honest. It was, you know, that last week when we were still doing things. And uh, I went in and I wasn't sure how people were going to react. I didn't know, you know, people weren't taking it that seriously then. And uh, I felt rude not shaking people's hands. So I didn't purposely go out of the way to do it. But I went and started getting set up and then people would come over and introduce themselves to me. And I felt like a jerk if I didn't shake their hand when they right. were holding it out there. Then even within that same firm, and, and they're going to know who they are, because I'm sure they felt the same way with me being there, is, you know, there was maybe about eight of them that joined me for this coffee break, and probably half of them shook it, you know, stuck out their hand for me to shake it, and the other half were like, no, 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 no. So can you tell me a little bit how your business has been affected by COVID-19? Oh boy, how has the business been affected? Uh, it's been definitely affected, <laughs> for sure. Uh, at the beginning, we, you know, things were seeming to be fine. And, you know, we had lots of projects that we're working on. And, you know, after slowly week by week, it was, you know, a couple of projects, pause, more pauses, more pauses. And eventually got to the point that out of our 48 projects that we had live, uh, we were down to nine. The good thing out of the nine is those are the larger projects that we have going. So the fees are higher and it's, you know, can kind of maintain us a lot longer. It's specifically in our industry, you're always, when you're, when you're working, you're always busy and there's another project down the pipeline. So you're like crunch time. And when that shifts and you feel as though, oh, we have time to breathe. It's really uncomfortable. I know how my team is feeling when there's a little bit more wiggle room. And uh, yeah, so I did a share out yesterday where uh, I got them to pick their own adventure. So unfortunately we don't qualify for the 75% wage subsidy because I mean, last year to this year, my team grew three times over. We have three, like our company grew 300%. Right. So obviously my billing from last year in April or March were way lower and now it's like three, four times more. So we don't qualify for that. And um, I basically, you know, I let the team know, uh, here's where we're at. So I showed them all of our financials, like to a T, uh, you know, screenshots of forecasting document, QuickBooks, being completely transparent with them and really told them, you know, we can't if, if here's what happens if we do nothing. Uh, we're going to be in a bigger hole to get out of and but we're still okay but it's just gonna be a hole to fill or if you know if people can sacrifice things and you know work less cut pay whatever and i kind of left it up to them so i told them here's what you can do here's what's available from the government here's what you can choose and yeah people are picking their own paths um you know some people are like hey i'll, I'll volunteer for some time or you know cut my pay so everyone has a different model that they're going with and uh yeah that's what we're doing I love that transparency that you offered your team. I mean, it, it makes so much sense, you know, get everyone on the same page. <clears throat> I think what a lot of companies uh, need to communicate to their team is that this is for the best interest of the company. It's not about, 
you know, losing profits. It's about having a company to come back to. And if the government can step in and help out with EI or, or whatever, you know, program people are able to sign up for, uh, it's, it's so we can come back to a great company, right? And uh, communication is, is critical for people to understand that. What I really wanted to do was explain to them, here's where we're at, here's what we've already sacrificed. And I really do care about my team. I love my team, they're amazing. And I wanna make sure that they know that they're taken care of and I'm doing everything that I can. So Danny and I did take a pay cut right away at the, um, when COVID hit, uh, and that was to cover our office expenses. So one thing that is terrible, uh, I currently have two offices that are empty. So I have this office uh, at uh, one end of Liberty and we ended up getting another one at 171 East Liberty, which is three times bigger because our team was growing. You know, I was looking for two people to hire in the beginning of March. So, you know, having two spaces and I was lucky enough to get the, the larger office extended for another two months for fixturing. So we don't have to start paying rent until July. But yeah, I currently have those offices that are both empty. <laughs> um, so it hasn't been fun, but uh, I don't know. I think we'll figure it out. Things will get back to normal. I mean, it, you know, you just got to keep pushing through and you got to stay optimistic. The projects that are still on course, have you had any unique requests coming from your clients to address new concerns around COVID-19? I've had nothing, nothing at all. Uh, really? yeah. And, uh, and honestly, for me, it's, it's another thing is even to pitch any solutions for that. I, I don't think, uh, designing an office in a way that looks like a bunker or it looks like a hospital is going to be good for anyone's mental well-being. And I think going backwards in the way that, you know, we have an op open office space, have that residential home feel. I think if you start putting barricades everywhere, and having that constant reminder, I think that will make it a not a pleasant space to go to. But uh, yeah, we haven't had any requests at all. Have you? I mean, you're you're on the sales side, so I'm just wondering, like, have you have you seen a huge outpouring on your end? We have uh, a lot of requests to help get people back to the office safely. So we've had to become very educated and and understand every idea and concept out there, and and we spend our days making sense of those for our clients. Um, we do, we have had requests, you know, can you redesign the workstations we bought last year and, and have social distancing in, incorporated into the, into the plan. And that's where you have to tell people, you know, you don't have that much space, um, nor will that, you know, be a long-term solution. Uh, if you have to go back to the office, you know, there, there are other measures around cleaning and, and protocols that you can implement that, that you don't have to change your furniture. I remember, you know, the beginning of April, kind of mid-April, people saying, hey, just buy more panels, buy more this, buy more that. And, you know, to me, running a business, I'm looking at it, I'm, you know, barely keeping people payroll paid. I'm not going to buy panels. That's crazy. Why would I buy a panel? I'd rather keep my staff on than buy a, a damn panel, right? Like, that's not going to, the panel's not going to protect you. And I think it's all, all, almost as a false sense of protection. Our biggest recommendation is just have shift work. If you need to come in, have shift work. I know I think people need to have a sense of their own self and their and, and understanding what they can control. So if, you know, for example, if you have like, you know, um, wipes and sanitizers that you can wipe your desk down. So you feel your own sense of control around your area. Um, and then just don't come into work if you're sick, obviously. Yes, we can set all these things in place. Uh, you know, sanitizers, 100%, uh, cleaning wipes, 100%, spacing for now. But that's, you're not going to have an office like working shift for forever. That's just not going to happen. I think eventually people will forget. So in each episode, we'd like to review a product. Uh, sometimes it's a new product or sometimes it's an old product that has just become much more relevant now. And so the product today is nanoseptic surfaces. This has been advertised to me quite a bit on my Instagram from a company that uh, in the flooring business that I, I used to work with when I was in the carpet industry. But the idea with these uh, surfaces is it's a skin that you can put onto high touch areas. So for a door handle, for example, you would wrap a nanoseptic surface around the door handle. And now anytime someone touches it, it's a self cleaning surface. 
it's uh it, it it has a the lighting in the office will oxidize the material that lands on the surface and eliminate it each surface lasts for three months depending on how high the traffic is in uh, in that office or that application the, the lettering on the skin will fade over time and that's when you know it's time to replace it but it's on average about three months so the most common uses are on door handles uh, but they do have applications for boardrooms um, so we could put these down on, on all of the shared tools. So whether that's in the kitchen, on door handles in the kitchen, whether that's a boardroom, whether that's technology, whether that's the elevator buttons, um, you can put a nanoseptic skin on everything. Uh, when it comes to an assigned workstation, they actually recommend that you don't really need one if it's an assigned workstation, but for an unassigned workstation, now you could have the whole surface of that workstation be a nanoseptic skin and uh, you don't have to worry about cleaning it. it. They're very bright, as you can see in the picture, and it's, it's kind of very clear that that skin is on there. So there's also kind of a, a safety feeling that a lot of people will have when these are placed in the office. So what are your initial thoughts? So my initial thoughts of that is, I think that's, initially, I think it's really cool that uh, finally those companies that have been around for quite some time now, actually, you know, it's nothing new, uh, but now they're finally brought into light because of all this. And I know that company did get some funding in, I think, 2014 or 2015. Uh, I think they got like $2 million to further develop it, which I think is great. But, you know, is that going to be something that's going to be mandatory? Or I think the other, like, I'm going to be devil's advocate here. Uh, I do think it's amazing having a product that can actually go ahead and self-clean. It does take over, I think, 30 minutes for it to actually kill the bacteria that was on it um, after doing some research on it. And um, yeah, I think it's great. But at the same time, it's, you know, are we just kind of creating these things to feel safer, right? Just for our own sake. Um, rather than um, it actually working fully. I know, you know, before what, why were brass handles and silver handles were so prominent before is because they were antimicrobial and they would, you know, kill the bacteria slowly as well. And then we kind of moved away from that because trying to get, you know, cheaper, faster, more affordable. I think like anything, um, any of these products or solutions, ideas that we have right now, it has to be part of a bigger program. You know, and that's that's something we get when people are calling us to buy screens for their workstations. You know, having a screen is great, but what are your cleaning protocols? You know, what, what are all of the things that go around it? And so these nanoseptic skins are, are not going to replace any other function. You actually still need to clean them. You still need to wipe them down. You just can't use bleach because bleach will affect the actual product. Um, so yeah, they can get dirty as well, even though they are cleaning there's uh, they can you know still show dirt so it, yeah it doesn't replace your cleaning efforts you know you still have to have someone down there wiping it down you know you should still recommend people whether they're grabbing it with a with a kleenex close by you know like some doors have or or they wash their hands immediately those things still need to happen uh, it's just kind of meant to supplement all the other things that you're doing and enhance them one of the other applications that was explained to me was let's say it's a boardroom table and you want to promote uh, physical distancing in, in, a, in a small space like that, is instead of wrapping the whole table is you would only wrap certain parts of the table. And that is the visual cue for people as to where they're gonna sit. So now mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're kind of using it to promote good behaviors. It's, <clears throat> it's not necessarily even what it's the original intention was, but now you say, okay, you only sit where a nanoseptic skin is and those will be appropriately distance in the room. Now would that ruin the surface of the boardroom table if you have like a veneer? That's a good question. Me as a furniture person, I should probably know that and I don't. I'm going to research that. <laughs> I just go into maintenance mode, okay? It's like, okay, well, um, how do you maintain it? Who maintains it? Does somebody come and install this for me? Do I install this? I mean, boy oh boy, I've done vinyl installations and those are not fun with giving it all the bubbles. Uh, yeah, and I would love to know the cost. And I think for that company to to be successful is like you provide a maintenance model so that you kind of learn how quickly you have to change it and then do that. But at the same time, like I said, it's that false sense of protection. Tatiana, is there anything else you'd like the viewers to know about yourself or syllable that you're doing to help against the fight against COVID-19? Uh, personally, I think I'm just trying to be very 
positive and keep the people around me positive as well. Really, you know, rallying people together and really working closely with my fellow friends who are entrepreneurs as well. And, you know, sharing thoughts and knowledge about crisis management and learning from the veterans who went through SARS in Toronto here and doing a lot of webinars and sharing that to my peers. But in terms of what we're doing as a company, we are putting out a lot of content on Instagram and LinkedIn um, just in regards to what does, you know, what can you do as a company to return back to normal? We're just putting that information out there and not charging for it because I think, you know, if I have to do an assessment or whatnot, like I, we're just trying to help other companies, right? So we're trying to help the real estate world, people who are, you know, who need feasibility studies. We're just doing it now because I know everyone's very tight. So just trying to kind of band together and really, you know, not, not be there to like make money. We're here to support and help people. So, and if that means I got to do some pro bono work and help you figure out what you need, cool. That's great. Tatiana, thank you for joining us today and sharing how Syllable is joining against the fight against COVID-19. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. That was a really fun time chatting with you. This is Jeff Barrett. Thanks again for joining us. Toronto, you are the best city in the world and we can't wait for you to feel better again. Thank you. That's one thing I hope that comes out of this. Do I ever have to wear a suit for work again? Like, come on. We are all sitting in here in our track pants and doing as much work <laughs> as we did in a suit. Do I have to wear a suit anymore? <laughs>